Alexander Shulgin synthesized a lot of thioether compounds, which are described in PICAL. Uh, they're the 2CT in the Aleph series. So Aleph refers to the amphetamine derivatives, where R2 is methyl, and 2CT are the phenethylamines, where R2 is hydrogen. And they all have this uh, sulfur atom of the aryl ring, and R1 is various alkyl substituents that have been added to the sulfur to explore the activity uh, in this position of the 5-HT2A receptor. And there's actually quite a lot of interesting synthetic bits and pieces in Shulgin's experimental write-ups, so I thought I'd make a video that just highlights some of the parts that I think are interesting. And so here are some of the earliest compounds in the Aleph series. And the names don't have any particular chemical significance, they're just named sequentially in the order that Shulgin came up with them, so methyl, ethyl, isopropyl are some of the earliest. All of them synthetically are derived from the lithium aluminium hydride reduction of a nitrostyrene, and that in turn is formed by the Henry condensation of the appropriate nitroalkane with a benzaldehyde. So for the rest of the uh, synthesis discussion, I'll just be describing how the benzaldehydes were synthesized. The first way to make these benzaldehydes starts from benzoquinone, and this was reacted with sodium thiosulfate to form an adduct such as this with aromatization of the ring because we've added some extra electrons from the nucleophilic attack of the thiosulfate, and that presumably goes through sulfur, something like that, and thiosulfate anion here. And the adduct was reduced under Clemenson type conditions with dissolving zinc metal to afford the thiophenyl product. And this is probably not a particularly pleasant reaction to carry out because Shulgin makes special mention that the experimentalist should be aware of the hydrogen sulfide gas which is generated as, as this sulfur is removed. And then once this product was obtained, it was exhaustively methylated with excess methyl sulfate uh, to afford this product, which was formulated in the Vilsmeyer reaction standard conditions. Uh, Shulgin tended to use phosphorus oxytrichloride and N-methyl formanilide, although nowadays you'd most often see dimethyl formamide being used as the source of the formyl group. And then later on in PICAL we see another route start to become favoured, so paradimethoxybenzene uh, being reacted with excess chlorosulfonic acid to afford this uh, chlorosulfonyl intermediate. Chlorosulfonic acid is the demon child of hydrochloric and sulfuric acid. It's a vigorously reactive fuming liquid and uh, the first step will be formation of the aryl sulfonate and then the further excess will convert it to the sulfonyl chloride. And then like last time, Shulgin used solid zinc again to, to reduce the chlorosulfonyl group down to the thiol. From reading the experimental write-up again, it sounds like this reaction is quite a pain because it's very heterogeneous. You have to deal with the still solid zinc waste and so on. It complicates the extraction. I think it's interesting to think about alternative routes to carry out this reduction. And I found a quite a nice paper from 2009 by Akimanchi, uh, and he and his co-workers described the reduction of um, sulfonyl chlorides with three equivalents of triphenylphosphine. And it's interesting to consider what mechanism this might be going through, but you might invoke intermediates such as these ones, and whatever is happening, the, the phosphorus is serving as an oxophile uh, to remove the oxygens from the sulfur. Of course, the serious problem with this route is the generation of three equivalents of triphenylphosphine oxide as the byproduct. Um, as we know, triphenylphosphine oxide was made by the devil to punish chemists. It often complicates workup and product isolation. In this case, it's sort of okay because the thiol can be extracted away using an acid base process that leaves the triphenylphosphine oxide behind. Uh, and also, this means the reaction is very atom uneconomical, but from reading the paper, it sounds like it's operationally quite facile, so you have to weigh up the pros and cons. And so that's the synthesis of the precursor covered. I can go back to talking about the final molecules themselves. Uh, interestingly, Aleph and 2CT, whilst they were both synthesized at about the same time, there was actually a lag of four years uh, between the first trials of Aleph and the first trials of 2CT. And initially, 2CT was considered to be a bit discouraging because of its lower potency and, and you'll, as you'll recall from the other molecules the amphetamine derivatives tend to be a bit more potent. Uh, the issue with the Aleph series which eventually led to its abandonment was the inconsistency of dose response depending on human subjects so effects could vary widely uh, from person to person. So, But a few more Alephs were, were synthesized. Um, for various synthetic reasons, some of them couldn't be obtained, so you might have spotted earlier on that I was missing Aleph 3. Uh, that's because the third one Shulgin wanted to make was this methylyl derivative, and for whatever reason, the chemistry just didn't work. 
In the case of LF5, the cyclohexyl derivative, Shulgin got as far as the nitrostyrene, and he describes leaving the oil to stand for several months while it crystallised, but for whatever reason, he never reduced it to the amphetamine product. So under some different chemistry now, LF6 featured this thiophenyl group, which we now know is probably a little bit too big for this position, um, but obviously he couldn't make this via the alkylative route, uh, so instead it was derived from the aryl lithium, and the aryl lithium was reacted with diphenyl disulfide as a, as a donor of the thiophenyl group. This kind of aryl lithium chemistry was used to make a few more derivatives, which we'll see later on. I also just want to give an honourable mention to 2CSE. If we take one step down the periodic table, we find this very interesting selenium-containing compound. And Shulgin made it in the same way, a reaction of the aryl lithium with dimethyl diselenide. It's certainly very rare to see a selenium atom in a drug-like molecule, and it turned out not to be so potent, so no further compounds were made. I think Shulgin also muses about making the tellurium version, but never actually goes as far as carrying out the synthesis. Quite early on in the series, Shulgin prepared 2CT2 and 2CT7, and these are fairly straightforward ethyl thio and propyl thio analogues, and these ended up being the compounds that were most extensively studied in human trials. Um, their effects broadly seem to be comparable, with perhaps the note that 2CT2 has more adverse physical side effects. 2CT4, with the isopropyl group, that was made as the analogue of LF4, but it was found to have high dose variability. And Psi2CT4, or Pseudo2CT4, Shulgin made this compound to explore the structure-activity relationship of the aryl ring by moving the methoxy group one position over. And this compound requires some different chemistry, because of course uh, chlorosulfuric acid will no longer react with the correct regioselectivity to install the sulfur at the position we want. Uh, Shulgin actually started from this dimethoxychlorobenzene starting material, uh, combined it with isopropyl thiol, and then treated the mixture with lithium diisopropyl amide to install the isopropyl thiol group. And this looks a little bit like an SNAR reaction, but of course there's no electron accepting groups on the ring, something different must be going on. And from having a look in the literature, it seems the most likely thing that's happening is you get the lithium thiolate salt formed in situ, and that can actually donate a radical into the aryl chlorine bond and, and cause a, a rupture of that bond, the formation of a thiol radical and an aryl radical, which subsequently combine to afford the aryl-related product with, with the formation of lithium chloride as a byproduct. So apparently it's radical chemistry that makes this work. 2CT9 was another molecule made by the disulfide route, so the reaction of the aryl lithium with diterbutyl disulfide. There's nothing particularly interesting to say about this compound, but in the experimental write-up, Shulgin mentions some other work that he was doing, which didn't lead to final compounds. In particular, he was aiming for this very interesting-looking morpholine derivative, and uh, this compound contains a very rare nitrogen to sulfur 2 bond. And it's not often that you see something like that in a drug-like molecule. Sulfonamides with an oxidized sulfur, very common. Uh, but sulfur too, having said they're not that common, I went to PubChem and had a look, and it turns out there are some fungicides and pesticides, but in each case you can see the nitrogen has some uh, unusual or very electron-withdrawing substitution pattern. Um, so perhaps it's not surprising that this chemistry didn't work out because these compounds are quite uncommon. Shulgin was reacting the aryl lithium with dithiodimorpholine, uh, this molecule in itself, this reagent, is a pretty weird-looking compound, uh, but it turns out it's used as a sulfur donor in rubber vulcanization, so that's probably why it was available. But unfortunately, uh, this reaction with the aryl lithium just gave intractable products, so Shulgin wasn't able to complete the synthesis. In fact, another way he tried to get at this molecule was by making the sulfonamide like I've drawn uh, and attempting to reduce the sulfur, but all those attempts failed. Not much to say about these heteroatom substituted ones, but I've included them for completeness, so 2CT13 and 14 with a methoxy and a thiomethyl group respectively, this was proposed but never made. Uh, 2CT8 with the cyclopropyl methyl group, and uh, by the time Shulgin was making this, the LF series appears to have been abandoned, so the synthesis of LF8 wasn't carried through to completion. Another cyclopropyl derivative, uh, 2CT15, which was otherwise known as sesqui, requires a, a different synthetic route, and Shulgin was able to make this in two different ways. The first one involves the alkylation of our common thiophenol intermediate with 1-bromo-3-chloropropane, and that formed an intermediate with the first alkylation going on bromine. And then it turns out, with the appropriate choice of base, uh, the sulfur can be deprotonated at the alpha position, causing the 
intramolecular displacement of the chloride to form the cyclopropane ring. And the choice of base turned out to be critical for this reaction with uh, lithium tetramethyl piperidide being the base of choice, a slightly unusual one. Uh, other bases led to elimination of hydrogen chloride rather than ring closure. And there's another neat way that this compound could be accessed by doing the disulfide chemistry but backwards. So rather than having a dialkyl disulfide, Shulgin took the thiophenol, oxidized it with hydrogen peroxide of the disulfide and reacted it with cyclopropyl lithium. So it's a little bit wasteful because of course only half of your precursor is converted to the useful product, but an interesting way of, of reversing the chemistry. For obvious reasons, 2CT17 was also known as Nimitz, and Shulgin points out that this is an interesting one because it has a chiral centre on the alkyl chain, so this would give us information about the chiral environment this molecule might be binding in. Uh, the racemate was made first by alkylation with the bromide, and Shulgin also set about doing the synthesis of the enantiopure compounds using the commercially available enantiopure alcohols. He converted them to the tosylates to carry out the alkylation, and took both of them as far as the nitrostyrenes, but unfortunately the project was abandoned and he never reduced them to the 2CT final products. The final compound to be made in the 2CT series was this 2CT21, bearing a fluoroethyl chain which was made by alkylation from the corresponding bromide. And in the extensions and commentary of this compound, Shulgin talks about some of the other fluorinated compounds he was thinking about but never got around to making, so he proposes 2CT22, the trifluoromethylated version. And then as he's writing, it occurs to him that the difluoromethylated compound would be halfway in between, and so in typical whimsical fashion he names it 2CT21.5. The difluoromethyl group is actually quite interesting because these fluorines are so electron withdrawing that they render this hydrogen quite acidic. It can actually form hydrogen bonds, so it's a hydrogen bond donor but with a very lipophilic surface compared to something more typical like an amino group, so it's an interesting functionality. Shulgin also mentions an attempt to prepare the trifluoromethyl thio version, so taking the thiophenyl starting material and reacting it with gaseous iodotrifluoromethane. It's often the case that introduction of fluorine isn't straightforward, and this was no exception. It turned out to be no reaction, and indeed there's a whole subfield of chemistry just based around how to introduce these CF3 groups. And so that's the end of the tour of the Thioether series. And like I mentioned, all of this information comes from book two of PICAL, and there's lots of interesting chemical bits and pieces. If you browse through it at random, you're always likely to find something interesting in the extensions and commentary sections.